Hello, Pivot. Uh, my name is Alexis McKittrick from the U.S. Department of Energy's Geothermal Technologies Office, and I'm going to be your moderator today for a really exciting panel discussion titled Decarbonizing Global Heat Supply, New Business Models for Direct Use Geothermal. So you heard that right. We're not focusing on, on power here. We are looking at direct use geothermal heating and in some cases cooling new business models, financing mechanisms, potential new policy structures, and even potentially combining direct use geothermal with other types of energy technologies. I am really excited to be joined by an esteemed panelist of uh, folks for today's Pivot panel. We have Zena Magavi, excuse me, from Heat, Saiman Todd from Causeway Energies, Neil Cavanaugh from Woodside Energy and the Society of Petroleum Engineers, and Tim Lines from Geothermal Wealth LLC. Thank you all so much for being here today. I'm going to start and kick off this panel um, by asking the panelists to do sort of two, two things. Is one, you know, give a little bit of an introduction of yourselves, kind of your, your company or the viewpoint that you're representing on the panel today. And then, as the title suggests, talk to us a little bit about what new business model and direct use geothermal you're most excited about um, and why. And we're going to start with Zainab. Thank you, Alexis. Uh, delighted to be here. Um, my, so uh, my organization is a nonprofit. Uh, we're a little bit of an unusual nonprofit in that we consider ourselves a climate solutions incubator and uh, prefer to have innovation be in the for the public good space. Um, and we have been looking at the challenge of methane and the decarbonization of buildings for years. And in 2017, I proposed a um, networking ground source heat pumps or really technically specifically water source heat pumps uh, to in using um, networks in the street to evolve off of our gas network. Uh, and I have a background in physics and global health. Um, have, I'm a recent entry to uh, sustainable energy. Um, and the uh, proposal of evolving our gas um, distribution networks uh, into thermal energy networks through the use of single pipe ambient bi-directional networks in the street uh, is uh, to me quite a, a beautiful solution that addresses so many of our system challenges, including the workforce transition, uh, the uh, equitable, affordable access to the clean energy of the future and its health benefits. Uh, and I, but I have to say it's, it's not a new business model. It's actually a really old business model. We we designed it in the 1800s. Uh, the the utility, um, the I guess regulated public utility model is all about upfront infrastructure cost with long term payback for the public good, and it's a beautiful model for us to reimagine and rebuild our energy system and uh, create a thermal network to um, symbiotically support the electric network. That's fantastic, and I, I like your 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 view there. It's not it's not new. Maybe we'll call it reinvigorated. <laughs> Certainly, really excited about the way thermal energy ne networks are taking off um, within the U.S. as well as honestly um, how they are being established across the globe. Really exciting stuff. Thanks, Dana. Let's go ahead over to Simon next. Yes, thanks, Alexis. Um, mm -hmm. uh, very pleased to be on uh, on today's panel. Um, yeah, I'm Simon Todd. I'm the uh, CEO of Causeway Energies. Uh, we're a startup uh, company in its third year of operation. Uh, and our mission is to decarbonize uh, large demand heating and cooling. Um, so when I talk about large demand, I mean industrial, large commercial, large public spaces, large built environment, uh, and heat networks uh, uh, as well. And uh, our temperature range is everything below freezing to uh, up to about 150 degrees centigrade. And our project sizes range in uh, megawatts, to sometimes uh, several tens of megawatts uh, thermal uh, demand. In so doing, uh, we're addressing 
uh, a decarbonization challenge that's roughly about half of the world's uh, energy emissions. Um, it's also um, a terawatt hour me measured uh, energy challenge uh, globally, and it's a uh, gigaton in scale in terms of emissions reduction. So it's um, it, is, it is quite an enormous challenge, but also an extremely exciting one. Uh, we, uh, we use industrial heat pumps as our engines uh, to move and upgrade heat uh, from a variety of uh, thermal sources, uh, specifically uh, given that we're rock lovers, uh, geothermal uh, energy. And we also have uh, models that we um, use the geothermal resource as a store, and that becomes particularly interesting when we're integrating with other uh, types of thermal energy uh, source. The business model that we uh, we have the ambition to implement uh, most of all is heat as a service. Um, and that starts with the critical needs assessment of the, uh, of the client's uh, facility, whatever it is. And uh, that immediately uh, creates a bias to uh, using less energy rather than more. Uh, so the disruption starts there. As I mentioned, we also uh, integrate with other thermal energy uh, supplies and demands. And we also integrate with other electrical um, uh, supplies and demands. And that's important because of the electric drive on the uh, heat pumps to get that integration. And what we're finding is that that integration leads to further efficiency uh, in, the, uh, in the energy solutions, which creates uh, quite a disruptive model, we believe, uh, relative to conventional uh, natural gas and oil-fired uh, heating systems. Um, it then follows that uh, what we want to do is find ways to uh, break the barrier of upfront capital costs, certainly by technical uh, efficiency, but also uh, this is where financing the capital costs uh, for, the, uh, for the client through, for example, an operating lease uh, allows the client to have a predictable annual quarterly fee for their energy uh, and, and gives us a predictable uh, revenue stream over the, the period of the, the contract project. Um, and uh, there are other benefits to this uh, heat as a service model, uh, which I'll uh, perhaps get into later in the in in the panel. But but those are the that's the main uh, description of the of our model. Yeah, uh, thank you so much for that, um, Simon. That, that heat as a service, very very interesting, and I think that your point around especially making it kind of more predictable for everyone, right? For the business owners, for the, the consumers. Um, I think that consistency is definitely a, an important messaging point here. Uh, we tend to focus right on, on uh, all the technical details um, and, uh, and the market potential, but that, that consistency is something that really I think will resonate with, with consumers in particular. All right, let's go over to Neil next for uh, mm. intro. Yeah, thank you, Alexis, and, and hello, everyone. It's nice to be here. Um, what, what can I share by way of my favorite business model? Well, um, it, it comes from where I am. I'm, I'm in Australia. It's 10 past midnight, and I'm uh, an SPE director with uh, Responsible for Asia Pacific uh, with the Society of Petroleum Engineers. And in my day job, I'm the chief scientist with uh, Woodside Energy, which is uh, an Australian-based uh, global company. Um, and um, the, what I have in mind is, of course, with the SBE to, to look for those adjacencies where um, oil and gas skills and companies and people can migrate towards geothermal. Uh, but when I, when I think about that uh, in, the, in the Australian and the Asian context, I think about the LNG value chain. And I think about geothermal business models at either end of that LNG value chain. So LNG is produced, liquefied natural gas is produced in Australia, it's produced in Malaysia, Papua New Guinea, Indonesia, and it finds its way into uh, Japan, Korea, China, and well, and, and increasingly into Europe. So uh, when I think about uh, the opportunity for a new business model for geothermal heat, um, it would be relatively straightforward for those companies that sell LNG into Asia to, in parallel, uh, sell uh, uh, building heat from geothermal. Why? 
uh, because the, the LNG is sold in long-term contracts on a take-or-pay basis uh, into uh, substantial utility uh, enterprises that can handle that kind of financial obligation. And this creates a very, very stable regime for um, a parallel uh, building heat from geothermal uh, contract to sit alongside. Uh, in addition, uh, the companies that are, the countries that are importing LNG typically have cold winters and they have intense uh, built environments. Uh, think of those tall uh, tower blocks in, in Seoul, Korea, which is minus 10 in winter, or, or they can be very hot. Think about uh, Taiwan. You know, very, very hot most most of the year, but but a very uh, dense built environment where uh, building heat can go very well. So I think it does sit quite well alongside LNG sales. Is my point both from the the seller side and from the customer side, and also because the the companies that sell this LNG are wanting to uh, decarbonize, uh, but they don't want to shrink. So one way to do that is to grow the energy that they sell uh, and to increase the proportion of carbon neutral energy in the sales portfolio. And then at the other end of the spectrum, at the other end of the value chain in Australia, there's interest, of course, to use um, carbon neutral energy to make the LNG uh, or, for that matter, for any of the other very substantial minerals processing plants that are uh, going on in Australia at the moment. There's a bit, a bit of a boom in lithium, lithium uh, refining, for example, and there's a tremendous interest in uh, uh, making green steel or possibly green, green aluminium. But anyway, wind and solar needs firming, and all these very expensive industrial processes that you might set up in Australia need firming. Uh, wind and solar on their own, lithium ion batteries are not, are not suitable. We're talking about um, uh, gigawatt hours of storage, and there is a technique where the leftover heat from a geothermal power plant uh, can be utilized in combination with a liquid air energy storage technology. Uh, so you use the surplus wind and solar when it's in, in abundance, make liquid air, store it in a big tank, it looks a little bit like a liquefied natural gas tank. And then you, uh, when you want to consume that energy, you put it through a pump, uh, push it up to high pressure, and then you add a, a heat to vaporize it from a geothermal well, and then expand that air uh, through a turbine to make electricity. So it's a little bit of a cheat with the question because I suppose the liquid air is making electricity, uh, but for the geothermal well, they are literally selling uh, heat uh, to the liquid air energy storage people next door. And that, that heat could either be first time, uh, you know, mid-grade heat production from a geothermal well, or from a high temperature geothermal source, it could be the leftover heat after it has gone through a organic ranking cycle. So I think uh, I wanted to share those because they're particular to, to the region, specifically Australia. Yeah. No, I appreciate that. No, you fit you fit a lot in there. And um, again, the the thread I would pull through it all right is definitely combining the um, the the opportunity right for geothermal direct use geothermal with other energy. Um, sources. And I think that that's something that we'll probably touch on as we, as we go through the panel as well. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Tim to give his introduction. Uh, thank you very much, Alexis. And just picking up from uh, Neil's point that from SBE, trying to uh, encourage petroleum engineers and other engineers to move into geothermal, that's pretty well what happened to me. And in fact, everyone else in geothermal wells, bar one or two data scientists. We all met at ATCE last year. That's the kind of annual uh, bean fest for SBE. Looked at each other after 40 years of uh, oil and gas experience and said, we want to do something differently and let's make it geothermal because you've got the skill sets to drill long horizontal holes and to control how we we uh, create flow conduits between them. And so we, we, we formed geothermal wells uh, late last year and we've been doing about a year now. And uh, the other thing is we've got a passion for data science. A couple of us are, in fact, data scientists. And so we thought, well, we need to look for customers. Oh, by the way, it didn't take us very long to realize that in the US especially, there's really no point in trying to compete uh, to make electricity with geothermal. Uh, it's thermodynamically inefficient compared with natural gas. But heat is an extremely good thing to try and uh, 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 offer to potential customers. So the kind of Heat as a service that Simon said, I suppose, is where we're going, but we're far earlier. We're babies in this. We've been doing it a year. Um, but some of the ideas we come up with is because we've no money, uh, we're looking to partner with companies that are interested in decarbonizing their processes and then saying, OK, well, we'll form a joint venture with you. 
um, and we will provide the subsurface expertise and we will provide the process engineering expertise to the extent you need it uh, to see how we can integrate geothermal energy or heat into your process. We are kind of a bit hot, hotter than Simon. I think we're probably looking at 250, maybe as high as 280 centigrade. If you look at some of these uh, um, uh, insulated drill, drill strings that allow you not to fry the electronics when you do directional drilling. So a bit on the hotter side, it's basically superheated water, superheated water that we're flogging. Um, and uh, and, um, and the, the pitch is that we'll, we'll, we'll let nature give you the latent heat of evaporation, which is roughly 500 times the rate of the energy input required uh, to raise from 100 centigrade to 101. So if nature does that, then even if we don't provide all of your, all of your heat, we can provide the important part, the difficult bit, and then you can raise uh, your steam to whatever process temperature you want. It's only, uh, I think it's two kilojoules uh, per kilogram or so, 2,000, yeah, two, kilo, two, two, kilogram, two kilojoules per, per kilogram to raise steam by a centigrade. So it's quite a low energy input, which natural gas can do. So you've effectively decarbonized a large majority of the process. In terms of the customers that we're looking at, I mean, we've tried to be a bit wacky and creative. We're certainly looking at mining. Um, and, and the other thing we're looking at is large companies because you do need a pretty substantial uh, uh, energy bill from the, from the customer to make it worthwhile. I would say in the States, probably three or four million dollars a year, uh, something like that, and, and probably around the same in pounds in the UK. Um, and although it's easier in Europe, bear in mind, because the cost of, uh, of gas is four to five, around four times at the moment higher than it is in the States. So we have a, an easier competitive advantage to make it work. But in terms of applications, uh, in addition to, for example, dry minerals or um, milk pasteurization we've looked at, that seems an absolute, uh, an obvious one, really, because you only need 80 centigrade or 90 centigrade to, de to, uh, to pasteurize milk. Cooling, some of the farmers I've spoken to want, want us to cool their product because uh, they get, um, they allow themselves to arbitrage by making, by, by bringing the product in, potatoes, for example, they mentioned, but the price goes up six months later when no one else has got potatoes. So you can arbitrage. They don't do it because the cost of cooling is so high, but with geothermal, it probably wouldn't be. But the really exciting thing I want to talk to you about is sustainable air fuel or aviation fuel, jet fuel. At the moment, most SAF, or that all SAF, uh, is produced uh, by using biological means, so there's growing stuff in order to then uh, cre create um, uh, the uh, the raw materials to for sustainable aviation fuel. Roughly four billion liters a year of aviation fuel is, is is consumed by the world, and you can use geothermal for pretty well every part of the process from direct air capture, which requires roughly 100 150 centigrade for the sor the uh, the sorbent uh, uh, to regenerate the sorbent. You can use it for water capture, which is also a greenhouse gas, believe it or not. Um, and you can use it for the fischer tropsch part of the reaction, uh, which is roughly 250 centigrade. You can't use it for the syngas part, which requires 1100 centigrade, but you could use the geothermal to make electricity and then, or hydrogen and then take it up to that. So I'm in the kind of creative stage. We are, we're kicking around ideas, but the real key is using data science to try and find potentially very large energy users who are sitting above very hot rock and then doing a level of cost of heat calculation and saying, OK, we can go, go call those guys up and say, did you know that uh, we've got a potential for you with geothermal? Thank you. That's great, Tim. Thanks. Um, and I really appreciate you bringing up some of those those applications. I will admit I did not expect sustainable aviation fuel to come up as part of today's panel, but I really appreciate that you're bringing up these kind of unique and different opportunities that, that these technologies are presenting to us. And the other thing that you really drove from for me is we have a pretty wide range of, uh, of temperature applications um, on the uh, on the panel today, which I think is fantastic. We're talking about a lot of different business models that are operating in a lot of different temperatures, which just kind of proves your point, Sam, right? That geothermal um, can kind of be, be used almost anywhere, right? That you can have a temperature resource or harvest a resource that will be able to support um, almost any um, thermal supply need. So with that as, uh, as, as, as an intro, and thanks to all the panelists for, for giving such, such great introductions of, of your technologies and yourselves, um, you know, these are new or, to Zaina's point, reinvigorated business models for a, a reason, right? They, they have not yet completely caught on, right? I imagine that there are 
barriers, there are challenges that folks are facing in this space. So let's talk a little bit about that. What are you all seeing um, in terms of barriers to, uh, to these different business models? Are they technical? Are they policy? Are they financial? All of the above? Let's talk a little bit about that. Who'd like to go first? Yeah, Alexis, may I go first and um, please just yeah, just a just a simple one with building heat. I think you need to be early on the ground with the um, the regional planning authority and the uh, the property developer. Uh, you need to get to scale. Uh, so you're you're looking to provide a geothermal solution in in my mental model in Asia, where where somebody is making a new town or they're making a new university or a very large airport. And uh, you're wanting to get uh, in, in, in uh, you're not wanting to, you do not want to be retrofitting it. Uh, you want to be uh, in, in early. So that, I think that's one of the, one of the barriers uh, to entry. And, and, and the other one, which I mentioned earlier, is you, you want to get into a take or pay regime. So the people that are buying this heat, you don't want them to go bankrupt because you'll be left with a uh, useless, very expensive geothermal well. So you want to be selling that to a, a big utility company. Okay, so I, that was giving me a follow up question, Neil. Is like, what's the solution, right, to that to that challenge? And it yeah. sounds like it's yeah. utility engagement. Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah, yeah. The same the same people that can afford to uh, to make a twenty year sales and purchase agreement for the supply of liquefied natural gas are exactly the same people that can make a twenty year agreement to mm -hmm. buy, uh, you know, so many terawatt hours of geothermal heat over twenty years. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. I'll go next, Alexis. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. I, I have a, 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 a little bit of a different situation. I think I'm at the um, lowest end of the temperature spectrum on this panel, <laughs> um, uh, using using the bedrock as a thermal battery, providing both heating and cooling. Um, and we have projects currently in the ground functioning, and we have all indications that this is lower cost today for the customer um, with the traditional utility model, we have a financing mechanism that the key barrier to the, at the moment, 17 gas utilities engaged in this pathway in the US is legislative and regulatory. Um, and you kind of mentioned the on the ground, yet, yes, at every level of the community from the municipality, the customers to um, the local government, uh, there needs to be clear permission and permitting. Uh, and we have um, passed uh, legislation in three states now, um, with many more um, coming, and this is very happening very rapidly because of the alignment between stakeholders um, to permit this technology to be in the hands of the gas utilities. So that that to me is one of the clearest barriers um, to moving beyond the demonstration project stage. Um, there are demonstration projects going in all over the country um, in the U.S. Uh, I think the second really big barrier, if once that barrier is cleared, is simply the scaling barrier of workforce, particularly drills and drillers. This is like water source. This is like a, a water well drill, um, not not necessarily oil and gas. And there is simply a very limited supply of both um, for at the moment. Uh, so if someone's got to step in and do something, call, calling out to everyone, that's what we need. And the last massive problem, which I suspect is the same for everyone else on the panel, is simply education. We, for some reason, in all of our conversations globally about energy transformation, just often leave thermal energy out. And mm -hmm. it is a massive portion of our waste energy. It is a massive opportunity all around us. Our water systems, our, everything around us, once you look through a thermal lens, if we could see it, we would realize that if we build thermal networks, we will have a thermal market. Mm -hmm. And uh, yes. that, that, that education uh, may be the biggest one of all. Yeah, so let's let's stick with that for, for a minute, Zainab. I really, really like that. And considering the kind of breadth of stakeholders, right, we probably have listening to, to our, our live uh, pivot panel here. I, I want to unpack that a little bit. So when we talk about education, right? Who who is is this the public? Is this policymakers? Is it um, again, as you say, better training um, within academics and universities for for workforce? Is it all of the above? And like, can we start to solution space a little bit in this panel? And like, what do you all see as potential solutions to that that really big challenge? Yeah. Okay. 
it's but, it's clearly all of the above, I, Simon. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly, you took the words out of my mouth. <laughs> All right, so that's a lot. Yeah. That's a, that's a lot. How do we how do we start tackling it? Do do you all have any any thoughts on like what um what can be done and kind of even who should be doing it? Like who who should be the ones that are that are doing this education? Yeah, let, let me let me jump in there, Alexis. Yeah. Uh, the way the way I've started to characterize this problem is uh, w- what we're facing is not a technology readiness uh, problem, mm-hmm. but a technology diffusion uh, problem. Um, so uh, we've been trying to uh, as much build a market as build a business, uh, if that makes sense, by, uh, by networking with all of the above uh, and talking about uh, thermal energy in the way that uh, Zainab has just uh, uh, described elegantly. Um, and uh, uh, in our situation, what, what we're focused on are the pioneers and early adopters in the in the technology diffusion curve because we believe that once those pioneers and early adopters appear next door to the um, to everybody else then uh, things will start to to reach a tipping point so we're very focused on um, those demonstrator projects that in in the sectors that we think that's very repeatable, very scalable, uh, and getting those first companies in those first locations uh, to uh, to build projects and get things going is is incredibly uh, uh, important. Can I just build on that, Simon? Um, I mean, we're we're both facing the same huge challenge, which is uh, industries who could benefit from geothermal just don't know very much about it. And uh, so a couple of things that we're looking at, well, the one is, the first is in answer to your question, Alexis, directly is I I suggest that universities that are offering courses in chemical engineering, industrial engineering, or indeed probably petroleum engineer, all have a geothermal module somewhere in there, Mm -hmm. because we've got to get the people who can spot in their industrial process how you could integrate geothermal. You've got to get them involved. And the other thing is uh, recognizing uh, we all come from the oil and gas industry in my firm pretty well. Um, and we're having to learn uh, other industries uh, in order to talk intelligently to them. So, for example, I was talking to a mining company who was drying minerals and I had to learn enough about that process to not look an idiot and actually to be able to make a, make a, a you know, reasonable response. And I'm a process engineer as well as a petroleum engineer. So actually that wasn't so hard. But it occurred to us that really what, what's missing from the industry is some kind of a midstream aggregator who takes this difficult problem of reaching out to different industries, which might be in a cluster, for example, with maybe a main industry and other ones around it, and who has the level of expertise required to, to, in, to talk to those people and establish how geothermal might work for them. And then, so the pipeline company is a nice analogy, if you like, where they also would handle the, the, the billing and all those kind of, you know, intensive activities, leaving folk like me and I don't know about Simon, but who are oil and gas people to, to make sure we can bring geothermal to the surface at whatever temperature it is and make sure that it's a, appropriate for a customer to, uh, to deploy. So that whole idea of maybe we're missing an industry chunk here that the oil and gas industry already has uh, would be a suggestion. Oh, that's such a that's such a great point. I love the mid midstream aggregator um, concept as 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 a way to think about that, um, Simon. And we talked. We you already heard a couple of really great examples about how geothermal can be combined with other industries. And to your point, folks have to know enough about those technologies, right, to be able to enable those those combinations and those new structures and formats. Um, and then the the other technology, other industries have to know enough about geothermal or have to have an opportunity to be educated about it in order to make those those connections or we're never going to get these kind of network systems um, oh, working yeah. in the way we hope. Can like, I just interject on that? Because mm-hmm. actually, I mean, I've spoken now to farmers, I've spoken to mining engineers, I've spoken to milk people, and I reckon it takes less than five minutes for them to get it. Yeah. Because it's, like, it's that simple. You're just going to provide us with hot water or superheated water at 150 or 200 centigrade. Yeah, that's it. You can sort it out from there. So I don't think there's an intellectual barrier the other way around. It's more, as Simon was saying, is you've got to get enough people to hear this 
and say, that's not so hard. We can handle that. We'll just take 50% of the energy out of the unnatural gas stream and we'll use geothermal instead or whatever it is. Process mm. engineers in the industry are dead good at for doing this kind of stuff. But there must be some barriers, though, because if we look at the G20 clean energy program, and I've just been through it in some detail at this uh, India G20 gathering, geothermal isn't listed there. Right. Uh, they've recently uh, put nuclear on. And uh, I think, uh, to answer your question, Alexis, about what, what we could do, there's an opportunity uh, for the G20 to lead on geothermal uh, with a combination of countries that uh, want to have maximal energy sovereignty and maximal local content and yeah. not spend too much money. And I'm thinking, you know, take a country like India. You see, the thing about a geothermal well is all the money is spent inside the country, isn't it, to, to drill the well. Uh, um, and, and, the, and the other thing is to form an alliance with countries that actually sell drilling engineering services or, you know, the, the, the global oil and gas uh, companies and the countries from which they originate, whether it's Norway or the U.S. or, or, or some of the, or, or the other countries that have got an oil and gas sector. But, yeah, I, I'd like to see that uh, ge geothermal get lifted up into the clean energy ministerial under the G20, uh, but before we get into the next one, which is in Brazil. If it's okay, Alexa, I just want to lift up part of what Tim said about learning the industry you're talking to. And I think that the education needed, I, I kind of blithely said all of the above, each each stakeholder group, each industry, each group like the G20 needs um, the message tailored to their situation and language. And that's that's a large task. It's It's part of, I think, why... And at the same time, there has to be consistency across all the messages. And I, I think that's part of why we don't see the thermal energy and the geothermal listed um, widely. And, and that has to be the work of all of us and everyone listening to simply begin to educate and raise up this critical option and realize that we are likely not going to achieve our climate goals if we do not start to leverage thermal energy of all kinds. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I really appreciate these these great calls to action from folks. I mean, the, the tailored messaging, the consistency, start now. Again, I love that thing. I'm like, everybody who's listening, start now. Start talking about this with, with your own stakeholders. Um, the adding geothermal to the G20 ministerial, um, going all the way back, I think it was to, to Tim's comments around um, a university and making sure that we're adding modules um, on geothermal, right, to, to university curriculums. I think that that all of these are fantastic, like easy next steps. Before easy, excuse me, fantastic next steps. Not necessarily easy to, to the panel's points. So we're going to um, jump into to audience questions here in just a minute. But since we've just highlighted a couple of really great kind of asks of the audience, calls to actions. I just want to give a little bit of space. Are there any others out there? Is there any other kind of, if, if folks could just kind of do one thing right today or start one thing today to make a difference um, in this space, like what would it be? I think we have a few, but does anyone have a one or two more they want to call out before we go to audience Q&A? I've got one, uh, which is that, what we've realized is we, there's no point us talking to geothermal experts and oil and gas experts. What, what, what could happen is if somebody or a group of people could write articles for every single industry journal that has a high heat demand and, and, get, and make it ready for the editor just to look at and then cut and paste or do what they want with, start to get it into the industry journals and also start to make presentations at industry conferences. Mm. Mm. I have multiple Alexis. <laughs> you get one. You get one. Get just one. Time. Pick, your, pick your favorite. So okay. Said, yeah. <laughs> no. uh, I, I think that one of the things we need to demonstrate is um, interest um, in, in having each of our own homes served by both geothermal electricity and geothermal heat or geothermal service from a utility. And so we've got a, a map that we've just launched to get people to just express, hey, I would be interested in that, um, which is a political move. It, it shows decision makers that um, there is interest, that this is a valid thing for the public um, and not just the engineers. So I'm 
I'm throwing the link in the chat. I don't know if that's going to work or not. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks so much for that, uh, Zainab. And with that, let's let's jump over to, to audience Q&A because I think we have about eight minutes left. Hopefully you can fit in one or two, um, but kind of tying um, a bit to some of the conversation around kind of what, what can be done in this space. We had a few questions around um, incentives, right? So we, we have, in, in the U.S. at least, um, incentives that have been um, developed through the Inflation Reduction Act um, for uh, geothermal heat pumps or ground source heat pumps. Um, but the questions are really around like what's missing, right? So we have these new incentives, right? What incentives are still missing um, for, for heat pumps and even including in the industrial manufacturing space to help encourage folks um, at the industrial manufacturing level to make the switch, right, over to um, geothermal heating and cooling systems? Could I start with that one, please, Alexis? Please, go ahead, Simon. Yeah. Um, I'll, 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 price of electricity. Um, uh, is a key factor, and it varies region by region, but particularly when compete uh, with natural gas as the benchmark uh, competition, um, it means that your heat pump system needs to have uh, a coefficient of performance that's uh, the same as or higher than the ratio of electricity price to natural gas price in order for the economics to, to work. And uh, so we find uh, quite often that the electricity price is burdened uh, with, uh, wait for it, environmental levies uh, that the natural gas price is not uh, burdened by. So there are opportunities uh, from policymakers to level the playing field uh, for heat pump use. Um, another way that could be done is carbon pricing. Uh, it would be really neat if I could uh, monetize my customers' ca carbon savings uh, with real uh, uh, dollars and cents or pounds and uh, pounds and pence. Can I follow up from Simon? Because I please yes, absolutely, and also the ability um, with regulation to pass value between a thermal grid and an electric grid. So when you build a thermal energy network of ground source heat pumps, you are providing a tremendous benefit to the electric grid, you're flattening loads seasonally, um, lowering peaks and raising troughs. And that value, we don't have currently a way to have that come back to the thermal grid. Instead, we're spending more on the electric grid to build out this multiple times what we would have to if we built a thermal grid. So the, the broad, broad spectrum of ancillary benefits that uh, thinking uh, thinking electrothermal uh, uh, brings to the brings to the applications and and, and to society. Integrated yeah. planning. Absolutely, and again, we we've heard it throughout the theme of this whole panel, right? This better integration, as you just said, that's I'm right of, of of thermal and and electric. Um, and if they're not if they're not thought of together, if they're not integrated, um, that that we're just, we're not going to be able to get to this valuation space where, where we'd like. Um, I'm going to, oh, go ahead. I just want to say something completely tangential here, which is yeah. um, de-risking the equity. So the, 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 the problem that happens with uh, pro geothermal projects, first of all, is that they're not well known by the financial community at the moment. But secondly, raising a ton of water to the surface, however hot it is, is nothing like as profitable as raising a ton of oil to the surface. And so the natural investors who would be those who understand subsurface risk are looking at these projects and saying, it's not worth the, it's the, the risks are not worth the equity return we're going to get. So mm -hmm. I would say one thing governments can do across the globe is look at how they can de-risk the, the initial equity. Now that can be done with insurance policies, which the European, the European Commission has looked at. There's some contracts for differences, which some some uh, countries are using. So far, I don't think there is a set, the similar thing in the USA, but we're looking globally here. But that would be my mm. my kind of plea for everybody: de-risk the equity, so we can get the big pension funds and uh, mm. institutions involved. Yeah, we want 20-year take-or-pay agreements for the geothermal heat. Uh, if you don't want to do it for a large city and an airport, what about every swimming pool in Germany? will be geothermally heated within three years. It's kind of an advanced market commitment. Yeah, because they're, they're, all those swimming pools are run by, uh, you, uh, you know, the, the, the suburb or the city, uh, and they can make a 20-year commitment. We, we've got geothermally sweet, uh, heated swimming pools here, here in Perth, 
and it's a low it's one of the low hanging simple fruits and it, and then it makes it more familiar to the public yeah yeah and i think do you, like this de-risking theme that we're talking through is also going to help lower the barrier to entry as you all are pointing out for things like, like getting more utility engagement getting more mm. larger and to the point of the the person who asked the question the the larger manufacturing the industry groups engaged that maybe don't know about geothermal but then it also ties back to that education piece right that, that mm. we talked through earlier so it all is interrelated. Um, we only have a few minutes left. I'm going to try to squeeze in one more question and ask panelists to kind of keep their their answers short. Um, this is around technology. So, what are what are kind of the startup technologies that are out there that might change? The economics or improve the economics in the direct use geothermal. So I would say really quickly, like what is one startup technology that you all are watching um, in the business models that you're representing here? Directional drilling and concentric boreholes for um, thermal energy networks. Insulated drill strings. So you can drill yeah. very and not fry electronics. In, in high, te <laughs> high temperature heat pumps that can use very low temperature heat mm -hmm. and still deliver 120 plus degrees centigrade and still have a COP of three or better. That's what we're focused on. Mm. And then, then for me, it was that uh, pairing up geothermal heat with liquid air energy storage for dispatchable uh, firming of renewables. Uh, the company is called High View. It's building a it's building a facility in uh, Manchester at the moment, and it's building another one in the US. That was a fantastic range of technologies that you all just brought right to the front, um, really quickly. Uh, thank you all so much for that. Definitely, yeah, a big everything from from drill, drilling itself, the drilling components, and the insulation piece, um, all the way to to heat pumps and and to get better integration with other systems. So, wow. All right. So we got a lot, a lot of technology challenges uh, or improvements to to work on as well. Um, I maybe I, I know we're at, we're at time. Um, I just wanted to take a second to thank all of the panelists um, so much. Um, Zainab, Simon, Tim, Neil, thank you all so much for being with us today. I think this has been a great panel and I really have appreciated the diversity of applications, the diversity of business models, the diversity of temperatures, <laughs> even for the direct use applications that you all have represented um, in the geothermal space today. So thank you all so much for your time. Virtual round of applause for the, the whole room here. And to everybody listening, I hope that you all have a fantastic um, rest of the day. Um, and rest of the, the Pivot Conference. Take care, everybody.